Coming up on Reframed. We do the positive, happy, normal lives. Well, it just, I just didn't find any of the characters like particularly endearing. Like I, I reckon that was the most inclusive and diverse casting I've seen for a long time. Well, that's what we're all about on Reframe, so that's great. <laughs> Welcome back to Reframed, the podcast that reframes how disability is portrayed in film and TV. I'm your host, Jason Climo, and today I have Robin Lambert with me as my co-host, along with this week's special guest, who is James Parr. And today... We'll be discussing a movie that uh, I don't think many of us really <laughs> loved, which is The Secret Garden. We've chosen to review the most recent iteration of this film, which was the 2020 version. Um, but I think, you know, hands down, we can say that I think all iterations of <laughs> this film was probably not going to be great. Um, but before we get stuck into that, let's learn a bit more about James. So welcome to the podcast, James. Hey, guys. Hey, going? Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Did you just want to start off by uh, telling everyone who you are, what you do? I'm James Parr. I'm 24 years old. I am I'm a few things, so like I never know what to say, but I am a model. I'm a student welfare officer and education support staff at two different primary schools. I am a triathlete. We'll stop it there. <laughs> well... <laughs> Jeez, way to make us feel inadequate. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, do you want to tell us a little bit about the the modelling? Because I know I think you've recently signed with um, Zebedee and that's pretty exciting and, and why you got involved in those kind of things. Yeah, look, I, I, it all sort of started randomly. Um, about, I know, two years ago, I have always been confident in front of the camera, I guess. My Jason, why are you laughing? <laughs> <laughs> I just love, I've always been confident in front of no, the camera, well, I, I guess. Think, well, I think that's like an okay thing to say because I have. So like when when I got, um, when I did like my very first thing, I was like, okay, like it was random. It was literally for my friend's clothing shop, um, her family business. So I was like, oh yeah, let's do it. And then it sort of just went on from then. I freelanced for a year and then Zebedee reached out to me twice Back then, I guess, I was so, um, sort of like, it had just sort of fallen into my hands. So I wasn't sure that it was actually something that I could say for shoe or um, a career path that was going to lead anywhere. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I signed with Zebedee, I think, last year. And, um, yeah. <laughs> the rest is history. <laughs> it's getting everywhere. Yeah, um, I love that. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think the really, I think like the um, sort of push or like force for me to do it was, you know, I had lost my leg two years ago, and when I had that transition from, you know, I was twenty three, so had two legs. I was an able body person. 22 years of my life and in that 22 years did I actually really ever see a disabled person or a person with a prosthetic no did I see them represented in the media or any any advertising no so when I went through that transition I really I didn't struggle with losing or having the leg amputated I'm also struggled with the perception and yeah. people's, you know, negative connotation or stigma and stereotypes all around that and how people would look at me. So I guess part of the push and um, also why I wanted to do it now as being someone who is disabled was to rewrite that narrative. One, that it is not negative and there's nothing sad about it and we do live positive, happy, normal lives and that, you know, Anyone can come be, um, become disabled at any time. So if anyone's going to go through that transition, at least I can say that I was in a position or provide some representation for them and, you know, to sort of make that transition a bit more seamless. Well, that's what we're all about on Reframe, so that's yeah. great. <laughs> Love that. I always sort of bang on a little bit about how I feel like when I became disabled that if society wasn't so fucked up about it all 
I probably would have been a lot less fucked up about it at all too. So, like, I reckon I was at the start of this year or maybe towards the end of last year, but I had had gone to an ultrasound. I'm pregnant. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Plot twist. <laughs> um, yeah, just for something totally random and, you know, the radiographer. Yeah. Is that what they call yeah, them? We'll yeah, go with we'll that. Go with that. <laughs> um, you know, was asking questions, what happened to my leg, all that sort of stuff. That's fine. I feel like someone, when if it's a medical professional asking any questions, I'm totally chill. More so if it was just someone, what happened, I wouldn't say anything. But um, so it answered all their questions and I was waiting for it to get to the part like, oh, that's so sad. Or she hadn't said it yet. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. And then it got to like, how old are you? And I said, 23 or 24, however old, old I was at the time. She said, well, that's shit. And then I was like, I looked at her and I was like, what shit? She didn't have an answer. Yeah. And I sat there and I'm like, no, tell me, like, what's so shit about it? And she's like, oh, like, you know, like that you lost your leg. And I was like, and mm. she didn't have an answer. And I was like, look, I'm not offended. Um, but next time you say that to someone, have a bit of think about it. Have a bit of thought about why you think it's shit. Mm. Because my life isn't shit. My life is probably better than yours. And, you know, thankfully I'm someone that's confident and I don't care. But if you were to say that to someone who went through a traumatic experience that then resulted in the loss of their limb, that's just going to reiterate that their life is shit or that it is shit from you. So don't say it again. Yeah, honestly, get them. Preach. (laughs) It's just like automated in their brain. Mm. But in saying that, I'll be the first one to put my hand up and sometimes I'll have that internalised ableism as a disabled person. I'm like, oh, that's, no, it's not sad. I'm just saying that because that's what I've been taught to say. Programmed, yeah. Yeah, or that that's the way that it's been portrayed to you because, like, sometimes, like, especially, and that's what we talk about here, is sometimes, like, film and TV and fashion and whatever the fuck else, like, portrays things in such a way that just keeps entrenching these ideas in people's minds. So sometimes I'm like, I can kind of understand why you think this way, but we need to try and unpack it. So even when it comes to modeling, even when it comes to modeling, I guess I get really picky and really sus on some sort of jobs because I'm like, why are you picking me? Yeah. And what do you want me for? <laughs> even when it so yeah. Even when it comes to like disability specific modeling, like whether it's a mm. fashion or um you know, I did one recently, I won't say what it is, but I did um, a video recently. I didn't really want to do it, but I just did it more so because I knew it was their idea was put forward very well. But when they actually released what they had done, I was like, this is, you've just portrayed and made that whole sort of, oh, this is sad. Yeah. Mm. And that's not what I wanted. So it's like, no. you have to be really picky and, um, I just did Melbourne Fashion Week. I did three shows there and I thought, again, like, is this going to be a tokenistic? Um, are they just ticking a box with me? But I guess that, I reckon that was the most inclusive and diverse casting I've seen for a long time. I believe no one was casted just to tick a box or yeah. for a disability. Um, yeah. No, it's great. Melbourne Fashion Week are doing good stuff. We've uh, given them a bit of our time on this podcast, actually. <laughs> Oh, I've gobbled up. <laughs> They're going to have to come on as like a sponsor or something. <laughs> I'll go hit them up. Next season. <laughs> yeah, literally. I'm like, um. <laughs> no, it's good. Um, Is there like something that stands out as one of your favourite jobs that you have done so far? And I guess why? Like it, maybe it is Melbourne Fashion Week. I, I think it would. Yeah, I think it would be that. I think that was the coolest. Um, You know, like I've done a few editorial, a few campaigns, a few just commercial live stuff, magazines, Jason. Um, that was just something I never thought I would have on the cards. Um, yeah, you know, and I kept thinking about it, like, you know when you're little and you watch runways and then you're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to practice walking down a freaking runway. And the next minute I'm actually fucking walking down a runway. I was like, fuck. When I was little, there was my brother was like, remember that time you put on that purple dress and you put on some eyeshadow? And he strutted down the street, like the main street, like it was a runway. And now you're going to be on a runway. I'm like, I prepared for this. Don't worry. <laughs> you were born for it. <laughs> now we just need to get the purple dress. Yeah. 
let's revive the purple dress. <laughs> I wish I could find a photo. If I ever find a photo. Honestly, if you do, send it through and I'll put it on the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Well, I think we've spoken enough about you. And, and now it's time to talk about our film for today, which is The Secret Garden. So The Secret Garden follows our main character, Mary, who is a 10-year-old girl who's kind of starts off as this really spoiled girl who is in living in India with her rich parents. Um, her parents then die and she's sent over to Yorkshire to live with her uncle, who's played by Colin Firth. Um, the story sort of just unfolds that uh, while she's staying at Misselthwaite Manor in Yorkshire, that she finds out she has a cousin called Colin. Um, and Colin is the whole reason we're really talking about the Secret Garden today, uh, because he is a wheelchair user um, who essentially has spent his entire life in bed um, because of the fear that he will develop a, I guess they're calling it hunchback syndrome. Um, and the way that disability is portrayed in this film is quite interesting because at the end, Colin actually does find out that he can walk. Um, and I guess the whole thing is that the secret garden is possibly magical and possibly has something to do with Colin seemingly getting better. Uh, let's just kick it off with Robin. I feel like you've got very strong thoughts. Gosh. Like, firstly, I just want to say that it was just, regardless of disability and its portrayal of disability, it was just a terrible movie. So it was very hard for me to sit down and, and watch this. So, um... I apologise. Yeah. You really made my work quite hard today. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, I guess, um, we should preface by saying it's based on a book, a uh, pretty old book, uh, written in a time that was definitely not as progressive. Um, but the portrayal of disability in this, I think, was possibly one of the worst that we've watched, uh, for this podcast so far. Um, very much portrayed, dis- you know, people with disabilities as being, like, dependent, um, like, just a victim of their situation. Uh, Colin, I think his name is, like, just doesn't get out of bed like um you know it's very sensitive and just not a very likable character anyways but um yeah and then obviously you know without spoiling too much the end is all about him sort of just using a positive attitude to overcome what may or may not be a disability in the end (laughs) um so yeah I wasn't wasn't really a fan but how about how about you guys there for me there was like a Okay, took me three goes to watch it. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. <laughs> and then the last time I was, I sat myself down and I was like, right, I need to buckle it's in. Hard. <laughs> it's hard. Yeah. Um, but actually, the more I sort of watched it, the more I actually didn't mind it. Um, when it comes to the portrayal of the disability, there were a, f- a few things that I took away. One, it was set in ni- 1947. So what a great how far have we come so far since then? Like, to have that portrayal, yes, it was negative, but then look at what we're doing now and how far we've come already. We still have so much more, so much further to go. Next thing, I'm diagnosing the father of Colin with Munchausen by proxy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, when yep. I, I thought it was going to be that sort of story when I started watching. Um, yeah. So I think... Because he, well, he wasn't disabled in the end, was he? No. Well, it was, like, sort of played into this whole narrative of, like, is he or isn't he? Is it the... Like, with the right the attitude, secret? like... Yeah, and also, like, that is the garden magic, or is it not? And I was, like... More so about, like, the attitude or that sort of stuff. I guess it was nice to see the other characters, Mary. Yeah. Mary and Colin say, bond over, say, their loss and then figure out that he actually wasn't disabled. I found that quite nice to watch. But I think the betrayal, yeah, all they, it was negative. He was stuck in a bed. He couldn't do anything. No one could look at him. Um, Mary couldn't even talk to him. She she did that sneakingly. Um, So I guess everything what disability is was portrayed the opposite i think there was one part that i was like oh that's like could could almost be a slight redeeming factor and that was when 
um, Mary said, like, about his wheelchair. She's like, nah, it's good. It moves well. Like, le- we should, like, sort of go out in your chair. Like, why are you not using this sort of thing? So Mary's whole initial attitude is, like, literally the, like, one tiny bit of like gleaming light within the shit show that this movie was I feel in terms of representing disability but also it was just kind of really boring and I mean all other times I found her like so irritating which I think was the whole point but she was so positive <laughs> but her attitude towards Colin and just like yeah almost like not I wouldn't say indifference because like she acknowledged his like disability but didn't really like phase her too much like she was just like oh like we'll just sort of like do this and that and like I'll help you sort of thing which I thought that was like the one sort of redeeming there was even a scene that I found was really nice I'm gonna say it it's not gonna sound nice but (laughs) more I think about Colin sitting on the ground and he's just in there having a dandy old time with that wheelchair and I just thought okay, you're not a wheelchair user, but how nice is it that they are able to have that sort of relationship where he gets out, he's just, tre- um, you know, it is normal, but back then and when the movie said it isn't normal and it wasn't perceived as being normal, but she was making it sort of like this whole normal, um, not phased, unfazed, and just sort of treating him n- not so different when other character were um i thought that was really nice yeah yeah Yeah. and i think even at the end when because he was using a walking stick even to see the progression of his mobility aids like as long as she asked if she can use the wheelchair yeah (laughs) Yeah. i don't know i think it was just like some montage (laughs) moment with like music I guess one of my like biggest arguments was like, why does this need to be remade? Like, could we not have just a better disability narrative out there? Like, we've had this before. It, it's obviously certainly not perfect, or like you know, there's a lot that could be improved about it. D- is it necessary? Like that we we do this? I don't again? know. I'm kind like... of like, scared that we're going to get savaged online by like cult <laughs> yeah. people that are like obsessed with the secret, secret garden, garden and they're yeah. like no it's the best movie ever you have no idea you don't understand i yeah. don't think we'll find anyone that's obsessed with it so I think <laughs> <laughs> very um, slow start yeah yeah just say that um there was also um one of the very first scenes where there's a an amputee using crutches mm. i actually thought that was quite a nice scene because it was just there no one was looking. Yes, Mary looked probably the first time she's ever seen one, so I think that's okay. Let's keep in mind that she's a child. So, yeah. she's, you know, she did look. I think that's fine. Um, but he was just there, and there was no sort of attention bought, whereas when you look at Colin, everything was so... Yeah, yeah dramatised. Dramatised. Yeah. Um, very... Everything was about him. And I think yeah. why he was so... Because you guys said you hated him. Well, it just I just didn't find any of the characters like particularly endearing. Like, yeah. I think why he was so selfish and so self-centered at the start was because everything was about him. Yeah. And so I think mm. over time it was nice to see that different side of Colin. But then again, that was only because you know he's having a positive outlook on his disability that may not. I don't know. I'm a bit confused. It was a bit confusing. I think they also kind of like played into a lot of stereotypes. Like with Colin's father, like I would say that in modern times, we would say that he has a form of disability. Um, Whereas back then they just called him a hunchback, which is like not great. Um, And I think they kind of weaponized like him as as a character because it was like in this remake, because I don't think it was actually in the original film, but in this remake, he has this like fear that his son is going to develop, I guess, the same condition and therefore just like have this terrible life. So he's like, just stay in bed all of the time because otherwise you will hurt your spine. Um, And I feel like they just played into this whole narrative that like people with disability are either like Colin who are just like hopeless stuck in bed or like Colin's father who are like, these like really bitter, resentful villains who will like inflict suffering on other people. I guess when you look at like the the wider picture, like every ca- character in that movie had some kind of trauma, like someone they loved has like died or like, you know, so like 
Yeah, you can't, I guess you can't expect them to be perfect people. <laughs> yeah, even the dog. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just like, I don't, how, yeah, how do you make a better movie with so many characters that are so, like, traumatized and flawed? <laughs> yeah, literally. I think they would have had to completely have changed, like, the whole, like, plot and narrative of it, which, you know, they probably legally weren't allowed to anyway. But still, we're reviewing it and it was a terrible narrative. <laughs> I, I feel like they could have made some scenes a bit more or you know the the whole narrative just a bit more and positive and i i I guess it it is a negative story because we're looking at you know everyone was affected by trauma and i guess that's why colin is bedridden because his dad's had so much trauma he's trying to protect him but then again that plays into that disabled people need protecting and we can't do things for ourselves. And it just sort of keeps pushing with that narrative. Yeah. Not great. <laughs> not, not great. In summary. <laughs> also, the garden, that's a forest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. I was like, that is not a garden. <laughs> it's a secret garden. Who's been maintaining that this whole time? <laughs> I sort of thought that they were portraying, yeah, the secret garden to be some sort of magic, and that was what cured him. Disabilities. Yeah, I just feel like they played into like every stereotype ever and they like almost weaponized disability. It would have been interesting to see them like highlight those stereotypes, but then maybe do something a little bit like subversive with them. Like, but instead they just did like textbook, like they were just like, let's go with this. Yeah, yeah. This would be great. Yeah, I think like 2020, everybody would love that. (laughs) There was like possibly (laughs) room there to do something like a bit different and to just turn those stereotypes on their head, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, like, definitely just use disability as a tool in the narrative to, like, be like, this is terrible and now he's happy now at the end. Yay, the secret yeah. garden is magic. <laughs> Instead of actually, like, delving into any sort of actual representation of disability or yeah. even kind of really defining what disability is. Like, I feel like, oh, my God, the kids that watch that film are going to come up to me and be like, I'll take you to the secret garden and you walk again. And I'll be like, that's not fucking how it works, actually. So not how it works. <laughs> Maybe you just haven't found the right garden. <laughs> Literally. Oh, my God. I was so confused when, like, all the plants were, like, dying and then, like, coming back to life. Like, I was like, why is no one looking around and being like, wow, the whole thing's, like, turned into, like, death. And anyway, I think it's time to give our scores. James, you go first. I feel like you're going to be the nicest. Out of five, on the inclusive disability representation scale, what did you give? Oh, one. Okay, well, that was not nice. <laughs> not even a one. Like, zero. <laughs> I thought you brought, like, up some points about it, like, not being too terrible. But then <laughs> no, I, I said one because I was like, is it one to five? And then I thought about it. I'm like, no, I can say zero. <laughs> it's like negative numbers. I think we yeah. had, like, negative five at one point. Oh, really? Robin? Oh, yeah. I mean, if we're going low as one, let's go one. Because, like, it, yeah, there wasn't much great about this. Like I said, there was a few things where I was like, oh, look, like, they're trying to make mobility aids, like, a tool, like, for, you know, getting out there rather than being some negative thing. But on a whole, like, yeah, it was just very, like, classic textbook negative stereotypes. So. Yep. Yeah, no, I was a 0.5 out of 5. <laughs> Just go with those half numbers so that I don't have to uh, be an absolute zero. Um, and, yeah, literally just because of, like, they just use disability as a tool and as, like, a weapon to, like, destroy characters but also, like, build characters up. And I was just like, mm, this is not for me. And to portray that whole disability, death, yeah. bedridden. Yeah. Can't do anything. Yeah. Can't look at them. Um you know, there's a scene where I think the, the nanny um, is like, don't expect him to come running. <laughs> and I was like, calm down. Have you watched a bit of the movie? <laughs> <laughs> Spoilers. <laughs> well, wasn't she <laughs> wrong? <laughs> yeah. He hadn't been to that secret garden. Oh, my God. <laughs> Too funny. Well, that is it for this week's episode. Thank you so much to both of you for joining me and thank you everyone at home for following along 
um, obviously this week was not a very good film. So I think next week we'll have to pick something a bit more positive. Um, as always, follow us on our social channels. Uh, you can just literally search Reframe Podcast and you'll find us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. And let us know what you thought of The Secret Garden. Um, if you hadn't watched it and you watched this first, I think we spoiled pretty much all of it. And also we told you that it's so fucking boring that you shouldn't watch it. So sorry. <laughs> um, but anyway, let us know in the comments or you can also send us an email at hello at reframedpodcast.com. Um, and we'll see you next time.